Our commencement speaker today, John Munson, is one of the busiest and most well-connected and certainly one of the most stylish musicians in the Twin Cities. John, early in his career, was the bass player for a couple of Twin Cities' iconic bands, uh, Semisonic and Trip Shakespeare. Excellent bands and excellent bass player. After those activities more recently, John is the bass player in a band he's just put together, Twilight Hours, and the bass player for the very popular New Standards. John's diversity of interests and multifaceted role as a creative force, an artist and arts supporter, were further demonstrated in some very interesting work he did as the, one of the creative uh, forces with the radio variety show Wits, which ran in the Fitzgerald Theater for several years, very popular show uh, established by American Public Radio, and John was the creative and rock solid and also hilarious music director and bassist for that show. I wanted to mention a little more about the new standards because that's actually an interesting model of a way to think creatively and freshly and uh, create uh, something new that's it's very interesting. It's a project that started when they began to, uh, with Chan Poling and uh, John and another a gentleman who plays vibraphone uh, decided they wanted to play jazz but we're no longer interested in playing all the, the standards and the jazz repertoire of uh, the last many decades. So they started getting together and playing and singing the songs of pop music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on, but doing them in really stripped down acoustic ways, making room for solos and jazzing things up and turning them inside and out and making a, a form of music and performances that are now often the hottest tickets in town. The New Standards put together a holiday show and other extravagant extravaganzas, and they're always sold out three or four nights for every concert in the Fitzgerald or the State Theater, and just a terrific band. So one final thing I just want to mention about John, he is an avid golfer, and as snappy a dresser on the golf course as he is off it. We played together one time, and I met him in the parking lot, and he got out of his car, and I thought I was playing with Ben Hogan. He had that, you know, that kind of beret thing happening, but most important, the knickers. You've seen that golf. I had personally only seen it in posters and pictures on the wall from golfers in the 20s and 30s, but there was John uh, looking pretty snappy, as he does today. He's a generous and inspiring individual, and it's my honor to introduce to you today my friend, John Munson. I am really honored to be here, and even more honored when I hear the music that you guys are making here at the school, uh, that choir. I, if you guys are gonna keep it together, um, I've got a gig for you in December that it would be really fun to hire you for. Because I've been, I've been having in, the, in my head, I've been like, I need to find a band that can kind of pull off that swingle singers kind of thing, really tight harmonies, but with a jazzy feel. It's a fun gig. It's a fun gig. Yeah, it's a, a, a very intimidating group to speak before, especially with faculty members like this, too. You guys are so very fortunate to get to study under these folks over here. And also, what an administration, people who all are very devoted to music. So I would say that you're some of the luckiest musicians in the city. And congratulations on getting to the, finish, uh, to the starting line. Um, but no, really. At, that is a big accomplishment for sure. I, I got to tell you guys that I, I grew up with a dream from the age of about 10 of being a musician because my mom was a musician and musicians were always coming to the house and I loved seeing them and what they were doing was just fascinating to me and I would sit and I would watch my mom rehearse with these musicians in the house and 
I started to cultivate a dream for myself of doing that. And um, I, the instrument that I picked up and wanted to play was trombone. So I started playing trombone. I got, I got really good. And I, was, I played in the Greater Twin Cities U Symphony, which some of you guys may be familiar with. Certainly some people in the room are familiar with. And, and I thought it was pretty hot stuff. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go. And I'm going to go to uh, Northwestern or Eastman or something like that. And I started to do auditions to do that. And what I learned is that I couldn't audition. I just melted. And I, I literally found that I couldn't stand. And after going through a couple of auditions where the, uh, the people who were overseeing the audition had to go and get a chair for me, and then I was like just locked up. I was like, maybe music is not the choice for me. <laughs> but um, so I respect, I respect you for what you've accomplished here. And it is a, it is a big accomplishment for sure. Um, Harry called me up uh, about three months ago and asked me to do this. And so for about three months I've been thinking, because this is not really my milieu, this is not something that I do typically. I'm not a commencement speaker. This is not my job. But I am a, I'm a musician in town. I've made a life in music. And I am proud of myself for that. I'm not, I'm not hot. I'm not a super hot player, but I've made a sustainable life in music doing the things that I want to do. And to me, that's a, a big accomplishment. I'm really proud of that. But three months ago, I started thinking about what can I say to these young folks as they're embarking on a life in music? What kind of diamond of wisdom can I give them so that they can hold that up and cast a light out on their path? Or what kind of protective amulet can I give them so at their hour of need they have something to use and I thought and thought about it and I came up with something and I thought it was pretty good I thought it was pretty good and I was going to give that speech and then a couple days ago Prince died and all of a sudden anything else that I was going to talk about seemed totally irrelevant in the context of what Prince has meant to this community in particular, and really to the world community. I think we have a, a very particular experience of Prince as an artist because he's so folded into the fabric of our town. But believe me, all around the world right now, there are people who are mourning the death of this man who meant so much to them. They're, they're mourning him in great ways, I suspect. I think there's probably a lot of people who are crying, and there's a lot of people who are laughing because Prince was, a, I think, an intensely silly man, very, very funny, silly man. And I think uh, there's a lot of people dancing because you couldn't hear that music and not dance. And that is powerful stuff. What's happening in our city, I think, over the last several days, all night dance parties at First Avenue, if you go online and check that out. As a musician, there's nothing greater that you could ever hope to accomplish than to have the world dancing to your music when you pass. I mean, that's, that's quite something, I think. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I think Prince is somebody, it's a somber topic. This is not, this is not super fun. But I think in the context of last week, what happened, I think we have to think about it and think about it, what it means to me, what it means to us, and what it means to you guys specifically. What it could mean to you if you decide to take lessons from Prince's life. Um, a little tiny bit of background, I've met Prince. People ask me, have you met Prince? I'm like, yeah, I met Prince in the way a lot of people meet Prince, which is like, hey, look, there's Prince. And then you go over to kind of like, maybe you chat with him or something, and he goes like, hey. And that's about it, that's about, <laughs> it's like, I guess I met him, I guess I can say I met him. I don't know if he'd recall it, although I suspect that he probably would recall it because I think he's got an amazing mind, an amazing memory, and I think he logged everything, and I think he used every experience in his life. But I don't have that ultra-personal story to tell of 
I spent days and days and days with Prince doing a thing with him. I wish that I had had that experience. And I have to say that in my band, Semisonic, when we were at the height of our powers and uh, we played a couple of gigs with Prince and festivals, in our fantasy, we were in our green room, he was in his green room, and we were both backstage at the same festival. And we didn't have the uh, cojones to go over to Prince's dressing room and go, do you want to do a song together? But I guarantee you, we were all sitting there going like, God, I hope he comes over here and asks to do a tune with us. Because we were, we were huge fans, and we're from the same town, and we, we you know, somewhat traveled in the same circles. But that, ne that never happened. I don't have that. But um, I do have the experience of growing up in this town when Prince was ascendant, when his star was, was rising. And I watched it. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm a doubter, I'm a skeptic. And at a certain point, you know, I was watching Prince do his thing and I was kind of like, oh yeah, there's this guy over here from the north side and he's got this thing he's doing, but I'm into punk rock and that's the thing that I, that I want to do. Um, and so I, I was kind of like, well, that's funky and everything like that, but, you know, can he really throw down like the clash or whatever? Um, <laughs> And the, the, the fact was, you know, I, I, think about, I think about what Paul Westerberg said about Prince. Did, I don't know if any of you saw the uh, article, but Paul talks about going in and seeing Prince play at First Avenue when he was playing in the entry. And he was standing next to a, a punk rock friend of his. And I think Paul is deeply skeptical about everything also. And uh, they were standing next to one another and watching Prince and Paul's friend turned to Paul and he said, I'm embarrassed to be alive. <laughs> I think Prince, if you're a musician and you watch that kind of talent, you're, you're kind of like, why bother? You know, <laughs> what is the point? Because he's that kind of artist. He's a consummate artist. He is making art. He's walking art. He is talking art. He is art. He is art. He made his life, he made his life art. And he changed everything. I think he literally, people come along, things change, life has changed. I think that's something that people have talked about up here. Things change, life changes, people change things, events happen, things change. Prince changed things, Prince raised the bar, then he jumped over the bar, then he took the bar and he put it on the moon, and then he put the, and then he put the moon on Mars, you know? He changed everything. He was a visionary. He was a visionary artist. Now, what is a visionary? Some of you guys know what a visionary is, right? Some of you are visionaries. I believe that. And the ones of you that wonder if you're a visionary but you're not sure, meet the ones who are visionaries. Hook up, form bands, get behind a vision, push, push that vision forward. If you don't have a vision yourself, get with a visionary artist. But Prince was a visionary, and he had the talent to back up his vision. He had the talent to back up his vision and make it real. Now, another thing about Prince was he was a lifelong student. He loved music. I think he's an autodidact. I think Prince went through school. He went to, through high school here. He learned music from I, what I, I know is a, uh, a very well-respected high school music teacher. But after that, it was all ears. It was all listening and making it real with his hands. But he loved music, he listened to it, he lived it and breathed it, he was a lifelong fan. The week he died, he was down at the Dakota checking out an artist that he was interested in. That's really cool. I don't think that's true of just anybody, but I think and I hope that that will be true of you guys because this great art, great music being made all the time, and you need to know about it, you need to learn about it and be in touch with it. The other thing about Prince is that he worked his butt off all the time. He worked so hard. Even when he was at the height of his powers, he was working, and he was always pouring out more and more music. I want to give a couple of examples about artistic vision. What does that mean? What is artistic vision? Artistic vision, I think in the case of Prince, I think about his song, Uptown. Prince wrote the song, Uptown. Now, Uptown, from my perspective, as a Minneapolitan, I was like, Uptown, why is he writing a song about Uptown? It was, at that time, it's kind of a boring place. 
in our, in our city. It was near the lakes. It was just kind of a neighborhood. But he created this whole vision around uptown where it was like black, whites, Puerto Ricans, everybody's just a freaking, you know? And, and that wasn't at all what uptown was. Uptown was white as hell. You know, there was, there was no, there was no like multicultural anything going on there. And people were not dancing in the streets. And, but what I noticed is that people started coming to Minneapolis and they started going to Uptown and they started trying to find this thing that this guy had put on a record. <laughs> That's being a visionary. He like made everybody believe a thing that, ha that wasn't true. I mean, it's, you could say he was a liar, but really he had a dream. He had a beautiful dream about a thing that could happen on the street and everybody could get together, all different kinds of people, and be in love and make a beautiful world. You know, I think the other thing about Prince is he... Uh, he dreamed of a, a post-racial or a colorblind society, and he walked that walk. He had a band that was all different kinds of people. At that time, there were not too many rock bands that had women in them. I can't even believe that now, because I look at the kind of talent that you guys have. And I look all around the city, and I see so many women who are rocking so much harder than some of the sad little boy rockers that I see, and I'm like... <laughs> These girls are going to set the world on fire, and that is the truth. That is the truth. They definitely have something to prove. And I love to see that. I love to see that fire, and I love to see that intention, you know? It's a beautiful thing to me. And I, I like to see it among any musician, you know? But anyway, Prince, that kind of post-racial world that he envisioned, I actually believe by him making that his band and making that his music, he brought that closer to reality, you know? And that's, that's a place we want to go. I believe that that dream is a dream worth striving towards, and I think he made it closer. I think he made it closer. That's, that's being a visionary. That's being a visionary talent. By insisting on your vision, by honing your vision, by practicing your vision, applying your talent to your vision, then your dream gets up and starts walking around the room and then it starts walking around the city and the next thing you know, your vision is walking around the world. You guys actually can do that. That is possible. But there's more to dreams than just fairy dust and, and imagination. And you guys know that because you've been doing it for two years or four years here or however long you've been here. It took me 25 years to get through college. So I know, I did, I'm looking out there and I'm not seeing that out here, but maybe some of you took a little bit longer, I don't know. But um, back when I was in this band, Trip Shakespeare, that was kind of the first significant band that I was in. And we had a record contract back in the days when there was such a thing as a record contract. And we were on a and Records and we had a big budget to make our record. And we chose to make our record out at Paisley Park which, as most of you probably know, is Prince's studio, another, another kind of vision of his that he made a reality, plunked down this amazing recording studio out in the middle of a field in Chanhassen. Seemed weird to a lot of us, but at, when it came time for us to make our record, we were really happy to be able to go there. And what was really cool about it was that Prince was in between tours, so he was at the studio while we were making our record there. And we had enough money so that we could afford to be in the top room out at that compound at Paisley Park. But that was Prince's room. But I think the studio was kind of struggling and they needed to make some money and they needed our money. So the deal that we struck is that we were gonna split days with Prince. So what would happen at that time is that we would record from nine o'clock until 10 o'clock at night and then at 10 o'clock, Prince would show up with Kim Basinger, who he was dating at the time. Do you guys know who Kim Basinger is? She was like, a, like the hottest blonde you've ever seen in your life, basically. It's just like, oh my God, who is this like six foot tall woman who's just got perfect bone structure? Oh my God, it's, it's Kim Basinger. Um, anyway, you, Prince had a lot of girlfriends, but... Anyway, at 10 o'clock, he, he would walk in, and then he would record all night. He'd record all night long, and we'd get there in the morning, 
at nine o'clock to start our session, and we'd watch, watch Prince walk out sometimes with Kim, too, again in the morning. I was like, what's going on in there? What's she doing in there all night with him? Um, but they, they, he would split. And, you know, his, his you know, guitar stack was there. It was always different stuff. He was in there all night long, like, working on songs, working on sounds, trying stuff out all night long. And he was at the height, the absolute height of his power and his cultural significance. I mean, he was a made man at that point in his life. He had had success that was unbelievable and off the charts. He probably already sold 50 million records or something like that. He didn't have to do another thing in his life. What did he have to prove? Nothing, nothing. But he was driven. He was driven and he could not stop. And he worked hard all the time. And you know, why do I tell you this? Because you may or may not have a vision, but hard work is in your grasp. That you can do. And you know, if you work really hard, a vision might form, but certainly there's a possibility of excellence. And you know what? Excellence has a way of coming out. The cream rises and you guys can do that. You can work that hard and you can make that stuff happen. I do believe that. For me as a young artist, to see Prince working like that day after day, I realized that even with my relative lack of vision and my relative lack of energy, I realized to get anywhere is going to take every little bit that I've got. I'm going to have to put all of myself on the line. I'm going to have to commit completely. And you know what? That is totally proven to be true. Because there's not really a lot of room for people who aren't fully invested and fully committed. You guys have shown commitment and dedication to get where you are now. But it really is. It's, you're at the starting line. What happens next is up to you. No one's going to stand over you and make you do anything. You're going to make yourself do it. You're going to have to work that hard yourself, for yourself, and, you know, really for your friends. Hopefully, I hope you guys have big musical friends, musical friends who inspire you and can lift you higher because that helps. That does help. So... I don't want that to bring you down because I do believe you guys are privileged. I think you're super lucky. Anytime I would see Prince perform, part of me would go, screw it. I just give up. I don't want to go on. I, I can't bother. But another part of me, the bigger part of me, would say, I'm inspired. I'm going to go practice. I'm going to work harder. And to lose a man like Prince, an artist like Prince, that's a huge loss. It's a huge loss to the world. It's a, I, can't, I can't tell you, I don't know if you understand what a loss it is to this community. It's a really, really deep loss to this community. He was a binding element, he held a lot of stuff together and made a lot of stuff happen. I think we're gonna learn that he was more of a force in the community than any of us realized. And he's a, a huge loss, a huge loss. But he created a legacy, and we all have that to share forever. And you know what? You guys have the possibility now of creating your own legacy, and we need it. We need it. We need visionary artists. We need artists who want to build that legacy, who want to make beautiful things happen. You're the ones who can do that now. So do that. Do that. Go out and make beautiful things. You can do that. Make beautiful things and put them out and share them. Share them. Give them to the world. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Pour it out there, guys. We're all counting on you. We're all counting on you. Thank you. <laughs>